Hey everyone. Serverless is an incredible innovation for solo devs and for small teams, allowing them to focus on the code and leave most of the infrastructure to the cloud. Today, I want to demonstrate how that innovation extends to the world of Apollo Federated GraphQL using GraphOS. But first, who is Daniel Abdel Samid? Well, first and foremost, I'm a developer experience engineer here at Apollo, but my GraphQL journey started many years before I joined. The first time I tried my hand at a GraphQL server, I immediately fell in love. And from then on, it was what I used to build every single app. I've built dozens of apps across multiple verticals. I built apps in manufacturing, where GraphQL was able to bring data closer to the factory floor and produce better efficiency and quality. I have also built apps in food service, where GraphQL was able to tie the whole customer experience together and provide for better kitchen efficiencies and iteration. And finally, I've built social media apps in GraphQL, of course, the home of GraphQL. I'm also the primary maintainer of the Apollo server AWS Lambda integration, and that's really what I'm here to talk to you about today. So here's an overview of what we're gonna be talking about. First, we're gonna start off with what is AWS Lambda and how are we gonna get a basic integration set up? Then we'll talk about scalable schema tips and how to make sure that that first schema you deploy is ready to be iterated on and is ready to take requests. Then we'll talk about stateless pagination and how to make sure that you can iterate across lists effectively in a serverless environment. Then we'll talk about authorization to make your graph secure, and finally, connect it to GraphOS. So let's start off. What is AWS Lambda? Well, first and foremost, it's an event-driven compute service, meaning that it only runs your code when an event comes in. It has zero administration, meaning you give it the code and it just runs it for you. And finally, it's pay per request. There's a few variables that can configure how much it costs. First, a static cost for every single invocation of the function. Then, RAM allocation, the more RAM you need, the more expensive it is. And finally, the longer your function takes to run, the more expensive it's going to be. But when I talk about event-driven architecture, what really does that mean? Well, in the Lambda environment, events could be really anything, but a few common ones will be an HTTP request for an incoming web request, a file upload to a blob store like S3, or an authorizer to grant access to services. When these events come in, Lambda sees those events and starts up a micro VM that allows your code to run in a very, very lightweight environment. It will then handle that event and return the result to the requester. But then five seconds later, say another request comes in. Well, it's able to utilize that same micro VM and handle a second request. But maybe 10 minutes later, another event comes in. And then event three is similarly going to start the micro VM again and then handle the event. So the micro VM only has a short life cycle to it. And what this means is that events one and three, you can see they're denoted in blue, those actually require extra time to run those functions. That's what's known as a cold start. So now let's look at how do we take an Apollo server instance and get it in integrated to AWS Lambda? Well, it's really pretty simple. All you have to do is call the start server and create Lambda handler function from the integration library, and that's really it. You're all set. You pass the server and you choose a handler. But let's take a closer look at that function. So the very first parameter is pretty self-explanatory. All you're gonna be doing is passing your existing Apollo server instance in. But you can see that there's uh, this T context variable at the end. Well, if you're not familiar with TypeScript, this is a TypeScript generic, which basically will hold information about what the shape of our context value is for GraphQL, for GraphQL resolution. So let's actually go back and add some context to our GraphQL server. So for Apollo server, when you're running the constructor, you can actually pass a value, a type value of context to the first type parameter. So in this case here, we have a very simple setup of a session where the session might exist or it might be null and not exist. So once we add that to our Apollo server, let's go back and look how that changes our function call. So now in our function call, we can see that the server has this context value generic associated with it. And with the way generics work, take a look at options as well. Options now also has this updated generic, so it now has the context value as well. But we'll get back to that in a second. Let's talk about handlers first. 
So there's multiple different event handlers that are built right into the library. The most common event you're going to be using with an Apollo server is an HTTP event, where you have a request coming in from the web, and you need to resolve that to some GraphQL data. But in Lambda, there's a few different events that might come in, and they're all slightly different in structure. So the ALB event, or an event that comes from an application load balancer tied to a Lambda, will not have the same structure as an API gateway proxy event v2. So they need to be handled differently. So we give these options to, to choose from, and they're all provided within the package. Um, and this should cover a majority of use cases for, for handlers. But if that's not enough for you, and you have a specific event type, maybe it's an internal service, or maybe you have some other integration, you can make a custom integration by calling create request handler, and then give it two type parameters. What is the event coming in, and what is the result going out? And given that, you can pass in an event parser and a result generator that will, using TypeScript types, hold your hand and allow you to build up whatever kind of parser you need. So now that we've chosen a handler, in this case, we're going to choose the API Gateway Proxy v2 handler, um, as that's what we're going to be using later. You can see that we've now filled out more generics in the function. So the handler is now a strict type. And now that third options type has that handler as well. So let's see what that options type looks like. Well, the options type has two things we can pass to it. The first is middleware. Middleware allows you to mutate your incoming event, mutate the outgoing response, as well as short circuit. So if you don't want the request to make it to your Apollo server, you can stop it right in the middleware and return in case you need to do cores or authorization before it even hits your server. The second is context. The context function in, in the Lambda integration will pass you the event that came in from the Lambda call and expects you to return a GraphQL response. Again, we'll go deeper into this later. So let's now talk about three scalable schema tips to make sure that you're building schemas that are ready to be iterated on and deployed. So for all of these demonstrations, I'll be using the very basic three subgraph demo, uh, the e-commerce demo. So in this case, we'll have a product subgraph where we, we'll have a, uh, the ability to create, update, and delete products, as well as list all the products. The reviews subgraph will be able to add and load reviews given a particular product. And finally, the user subgraph will be able to resolve users, create user sessions, and return the current user. So let's look at our first tip. So take a look at this mutation here. This is a very common mutation that you see in monograph design. It's a root mutation where you're going to add a review to a product, where we pass in the product ID and the review. But if you look at it for a second and think, how would I scale this to a supergraph where there's multiple subgraphs involved, you'll very quickly run into a problem. And the main question that you'll have to answer is, how might we validate the product ID? Well, there's multiple options we could do. I mean, first, maybe we could do another round trip to the supergraph to pull the product query and see does that product exist. But the issue with that is maybe you have some complex authorization or authentication on your supergraph that the subgraph now has to implement, and you'll have just a, a mess of authorization. Or maybe you could check the product database or its microservice directly. And this is great, but now you have the reviews team talking directly to the, products team the product team's resources, which is exactly what you were trying to avoid with Supergraph. So let me propose a different idea. Remember that mutation entities don't just have to be on the query side. They can be on the mutation side as well. So take a look at this schema. So now, instead of a root mutation being add review, where you have to directly pass in the product ID and the review, Look here how now we have a root mutation of product where we pass it an ID and it returns a nullable product mutation entity. And then on the reviews subgraph, all we have to do is to the product mutation entity, we add a field called add review that now has the review input alone. So this might be a little complex to look at in schema terms, but let's now look at it on the query side. So here's that same mutation where we're still just passing in a product ID and a review, but let's take a look at what the subgraphs look like now. So now, instead of the reviews subgraph being called directly, we now are first calling the product subgraph. And then once the product subgraph returns, we're then going to the reviews subgraph. So what does that mean in the case where we have an invalid product ID? 
Well, when the invalid product ID comes in, the product subgraph is obviously linked to all the product databases or its microservice, and it can load in that particular product and, and give you a guarantee that that product mutation entity is valid. So if it's valid, it will continue on. But in the case that it's invalid, the null will be returned, in which case the add review mutation on the on the review subgraph will never be called. It won't make it to that point because the null is returned early. So this changes the architecture such that now the review subgraph can rely on the guarantee of the product subgraph to know that every product mutation that it's going to be receiving, the product mutation entity that is, that it's gonna be receiving will be a valid product. So it no longer needs to worry about the product ID and can just rely on the product subgraph. So let's talk about something else. The next step I want to discuss is scalar lock-in, which is a common pitfall on monographs and supergraphs alike. But scalar lock-in is the idea that once you choose a scalar as a type, it is very difficult to modify that type unless you have some very good coordination between your client and server teams. So let's take this example. We have a product entity where we have an ID and we have a price and the price is represented as an integer to avoid all the floating point nonsense. So our, cons our consumer of our grass, uh, graph comes to us and has a couple of requests. So these two requests are pretty simple. They now want to have the GraphQL resolver do the formatting for our pricing. So we want to show dollar sign, you know, $5 or something like that. And then they also want the products, some products to show the word free for $0 or 0.00, .00 controlled by the product. Well, okay, now that you have this, how are we going to implement that in our product type? Well, we could add some more fields. We could maybe add price str or price formatted or price v2, but really you can already tell none of those really feel ergonomic as now you have a lot of pricing information on the product when really it should be encapsulated in the price. So, Let's look at a different way to go about it. If instead of putting the scalar directly on our product type, if we further represent that scalar with a subtype, this allows us to unlock future mobility in schema iteration. That int that was just represented as a price before is now under the amount field of currency. And this gives us two benefits. First off, that int is now much further described. So now we know that not only is it an int, but it's an amount of currency. And then furthermore, it allows us to kind of iterate on that type and add more fields to that. So let's see what that looks like. Well, our request was a lot simpler now. Because we were able to just add the formatted string to this type, the request from the consumer is super easy to implement and doesn't cause any breaking changes with the client. And speaking of consistency, this leads into our next tip. Entities are not just objects with IDs. With the addition of the key on the field amount, we have now turned our basic currency type into an entity that represents currency across our entire supergraph. So this allows us to have a consistent model for resolving currency across any of our graphs, rather that be the products or maybe subscriptions or anything else. So thinking back to our consumer's request though, there's kind of something I've omitted from this, and that's the idea that we have this, we wanna show free on some products in 0.0, .0 on others. Well, that's really easy to do in a monograph. We can just take a look at the product that is being requested from and resolve it from there. But on a super graph, we are now crossing the boundary of subgraphs where it's no longer trivial to just do something like, like this. So how are we gonna include that? So here we can actually add another key, right? We can add a free format that will be an enum that describes the two types that we're gonna be representing. And we can add it as nullable as well so that the clients don't necessarily have to send it. And this is great, and this actually fixes our problem, but our client made it clear that we, they really only care about the amount for computation and the formatted string for any visual representation of that price. They really don't care about the free format that, that we've just added. We really don't even need to expose it to them. So what can we do about that? Well, we can add the inaccessible type we can add the inaccessible directive, more rather, uh, to the free format field, and that will make it such that it's a part of our key, it's gonna be a piece of data that's making it between subgraphs, but our client will not see it and they don't need to know about it. So our resultant supergraph will have amount and formatted, and free format will just be a piece of data that, that is required between two subgraphs.
So now let's talk about stateless pagination. So if you're unfamiliar with relay style pagination, I just don't want to do a very quick overview of it. Uh, what it is, is you have a field with uh, two, at least four forward pagination. You have uh, first, which describes how many objects you want to load. And then you have after, which represents the cursor of where you want to start iteration from. And then finally, you'll have a review connection is what it returns. So you're, you might be re used to returning a list, but in this case, we actually want to return a connection which has a bit more information on it. So the review connection actually includes an a list of edges that represents the, which is basically just a wrapper for the review node, and then the page info that describes where are we in our pagination, where, what is the end cursor, so what was the last thing that we loaded, and then does it have a next page? Is there more to be loaded? So one of my favorite ways to implement pagination in really any uh, any specification is using async iterators. If you've never used async generator functions in JavaScript before, they are truly phenomenal in their capabilities of abstracting away complexity of iteration. So in this case, we're looking to load all of the reviews for a particular product. So we're gonna pass in the product ID and then start from or after or our cursor is where we're gonna start the iteration from. And notice how it's null, where null represents we're just gonna start from the beginning. So in this pseudocode here, we're gonna initialize a database cursor or a connection to Redis, or we're gonna start a DynamoDB transfer or whatever it is, and then we're gonna start, we're gonna hop directly into a while true loop, which is a little weird and a little scary, but I'll explain what that means. So first we're gonna load a chunk from the database, and a chunk might represent 10 or 100 or whatever's feasible for your database. It's gonna load in that chunk, and then we're gonna iterate over each one of those elements and yield each one. So what this means is that the result of this async generator function is an, is an iterator that waits for the database to load and then yields each and every result individually for the database. So what this means for our consumer is that next time we load a chunk, it's completely opaque and the consumer doesn't need to worry about any of the semantics of the database cursor or where it was at, it can just start from here. Then another little tidbit is that if you need to do any cleanup in these async iterator functions, um, a common misconception is that it's difficult to implement, but in reality, if you just implement a try and finally loop, a catch block here, um, you can put all your cleanup in the finally block and that will run as soon as the last iteration occurs on your iterator. So let's actually get this implemented. So for our reviews query in our resolver, we're gonna load in a array of review models, that's the representation of our review, and then we're gonna kick off the iterator, right? So we're gonna call this load all function, we're gonna pass in the product ID, and then we're also gonna pass in the after, right? And again, it might be null. So once we have our iterator, we can use the for await loop in JavaScript to wait for each yield of that iterator. And for every single yield, we want to push that object onto the reviews array, and then if we're at the length that we desire, we're gonna break out. And then I think the coolest part is we can call one more function on that iterator. We can call await iterator.next, and it will return a done property that will tell us if the iteration is done or not. And then moving on to the return value, we can see where that's utilized. The edges is just a mapping of our reviews, and the page info stores the cursor for that last element in the array, and then the done Boolean represents if there's a next page or not. So if the, the iterator can actually tell us if there's going to be more iteration or not. So now that we have that set up, let's talk about authorization, something that's very important for cloud routers. So looking at our infrastructure on a high level view, we've got our consumer, we've got our GraphOS cloud router, we've got our API gateway, and then we have our subgraphs that are behind all that. So there's two very important pieces we need to secure. The consumer will have authorization and authentication associated with it, and then our API gateway, we need to have some guarantee that it's our, it's our cloud router only that's accessing this gateway as accessing arbitrary entities is a, is a security risk. So let's update our infrastructure and show how we can get that implemented. So like I mentioned, our consumer is going to be passing along an authorization header that will be passed all the way back to our subgraphs. And then the X router token will be passed from our GraphOS cloud router to have a pre-shared key so that we can guarantee that it is our cloud router that's contacting our API gateway and nothing else. But how are we gonna implement all that? So on API gateway, we can continue and add a Lambda authorizer to the gateway. So what does this look like? 
Well, first off, we need to do the router check. We need to first evaluate the X router token header and compare it against the known value. And then be very careful here because when you're doing equations like this and checking for equality, you need to make sure you're using timing safe equal for something like a pre-shared key. It's extremely important and I won't get into the details of a timing attack, but if somebody had enough time, they could brute force your, your pre-shared key if it's not using a timing safe method of, of equality check. So if the router check comes back with a token that isn't valid, we want to return is authorized false. And what that tells our API gateway is that this request should not be allowed to go through, the gate is closed, nothing is, is allowed to pass. And we don't care about context here because it's not authorized at all. But that changes when we're looking for the user. So the user check allows us to verify the authorization JSON web token. So take a look at these two examples. We have a valid user where in the case that it's a valid user with a uh, JSON web token, we have is authorized set to true because we do want their request to pass. And the context will include the user ID of that user that was stored on the JSON web token. Then for unauthenticated users, we still actually want their request to pass because we have certain fields on our supergraph that we allow unauthenticated users to, to access. But in this case, the context for that user is going to be user ID null, as there's no user associated with that request. So this actually ties all the way back to our creation of the request handler. Now that we have that all set, how can we make it such that our request handler is able to handle a, a more specific type of, of event. Well, in this case, we can call the API gateway proxy event v2 with lambda authorizer type uh, that contains an object with our user ID of string or null. And if you remember back, that's exactly the shape of our context, uh, of our authorization context from the lambda authorizer. The API gateway will pass it on to us and it will be in our event type. But now we have the context in our event. How do we actually get it into our GraphQL resolve context. Well, what we can do is we can pull that information out of the incoming event in our context creation function. As you can see here, we pull out the lambda authorizer and then we pull lambda.userID, which is the context that we computed previously. In this case, we don't actually have access to is authenticated true or false because that is something that API Gateway cares about and your subgraph will never ever see is authenticated false because API Gateway will not be passing on those requests. And once you have that in your, in your context, you can use patterns you're very familiar with, like um, looking at the context and seeing if the user ID is null and making that request unauthorized, or assuring that whatever uh, entity is being updated is actually created by that particular user. So the final step that we have in our deployment is GraphOS configuration. Now that we have everything set, ready to go, how do we get GraphOS configured? Well, first let's take a step back and just have a little reminder of what is GraphOS. So GraphOS is a managed platform for supergraph updates, linting, and validation, which comes with automatic metrics and tracing. And then most importantly for us, the cloud router comes as a hosted router for lightning fast query planning and will actually execute our query. GraphOS and Lambda are actually the perfect pair too. This, th this pairing allows for the Apollo router to fill in for features like defer and subscriptions that would be imp impossible or very difficult to implement in Lambda otherwise. Both services are pay per request with very, very generous free tiers. And on the GraphOS side, it's fully managed and easily scalable. And if you hit our limit of 100 transactions per second, we have the dedicated tier after. So to configure our cloud router, really the big thing we need to do is we need to get that pre-shared key set up. So we have our router token that has my very super secret PSK um, set as a secret in the cloud router configuration. And once we do that, we can do a few more configurations that will tell the router what to do with all the headers that we have. So the headers, the first one is the authorization header. That's coming all the way from our consumer and we wanna set that to propagate, right? We wanna send that to API Gateway to then be caught by our authorizer function. And the other thing we wanna do is we wanna insert the X router token header as well. Now this one's a little different because we're statically typing a value that's a reference to the secret that we just set up. So once we have that all set up, Everything should be all set to go to make the query. So after a little bit of waiting, we should run our first query and there we go. Once we run this query, we can see that this query includes everything that we've talked about from the price and currency to the review subgraph to pagination. And it all happens in 243 milliseconds after a little bit of warming up of the Lambda functions. Um, 
Yeah, thank you so much for listening today. If you have any questions, feel free to tap my shoulder if you catch me walking around, stop by my topic table listed here, and add me on LinkedIn and we can chat later. Thank you and enjoy the rest of GraphQL Summit. Thank <laughs> you.